All right, so yesterday we looked at a review for the midterm, but it didn't record with sound, so we're going to go over it one more time. So the midterm is next week, and it's the end of the halfway point of the course. The first half of the course is chapters 1 through 5, and the second half is chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. And the midterm is 100% multiple choice. Just multiple choice, 40 questions. And I'd like you to be able to understand what you're going to end up seeing. So we're going to cover this now. Then we'll have our mass break. And then when we get back, we'll get into chapter 5. So in order to do well on the midterm, we're going to go back to chapter 1. And in chapter 1, you may recall that we looked at the Canadian political system. And for example, we have this chart that looks at the seating arrangement in the House of Commons. And it's not that I want you to memorize who sits where, because it's labeled. I want you to apply the knowledge. So for example, the first question says, referencing details within the seating chart. So then you go back, you look at the chart. It says the individual who is in the best position to serve as a neutral moderator. So who's in a neutral position? You have to look at the nuances within the source, the idea that we have some on one side, some on the other, who's neutral down the middle, and think about the roles that people play. And then the answer will be there for you. The seating arrangement shown above is intended to encourage something. So why do we have the opposing party sit straight across? So the opposition shadow minister will sit right across from the minister whose responsibility it is that they're shadowing. So there's some application of vocabulary. So application of vocabulary too, when we look at the branches of government and the different descriptors of the Canadian system versus the American system. So in the US, we talk about checks and balances. And in Canada, we talk about things like party solidarity, party discipline, cabinet solidarity, and responsible government. So you'll need to know the working definitions of vocabulary to do well. So this weekend, my suggestion for you would be to go back over the four chapters that we finished and that'll help you prep for the majority of the questions you will see next week. We also spent some time looking at election results and with regards to election results we focused in on the electoral system and how first past the post may distort the will of the people. So in this chart, you're seeing a distortion of the will of the people because the liberals had less percentage of the popular vote than the conservatives, yet we have a liberal government today in Canada with 157 seats. So when we talked about the electoral system first past the post, as opposed to proportional representation, where you'd have the same number of seats percentage-wise as your popular vote. But we also did some things like figuring out what's the difference between a minority and a majority government based upon how many seats out of the possible 100% that you have. So anything over 50% would be a majority government. We discussed the advantages and disadvantages of majority and minority governments as well. One thing that we also talked about with regards to the electoral system is how some parties may be disadvantaged. So looking at the Green Party there, for example, they had three seats, but they had 6.5% of the vote. If there are 338 total seats in the House of Commons, 6.5% of 338 is a lot more than three. So even 6.5% of 300 would be almost 20. So uh, they are being underrepresented in terms of the will of the people is not being expressed. So we'll have some questions about that. We'll also have some questions about the branches of government, the executive, legislative, judicial branches. So it'll be important to know what branch does what function. And for example, as you can see number seven, where's the prime minister at? Which branches does the prime minister belong in? Speaking of the prime minister, there is our prime minister, the right honorable Justin Trudeau. And we also talked about in chapter one, the idea of the media being a watchdog of democracy. We talked about lobby groups. We talked about other functions that media does, including distracting us and promoting agendas. And we've done a lot of work this year with breaking down cartoons to find ideological perspectives. So here's a, a question where you get to break down a cartoon to find an ideological perspective based upon the details within the cartoon. And then you can see, what is the cartoon suggesting about the media and their function? 
Here's a graph about media, and we want you to look at a trend. The trend of people using Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as their primary pathway to gather news. What, what effect might that have on our political lives? So that's chapter one. Next up, we did chapter two, and you can see that chapter one had 10 questions, chapter two had five. Some chapters are bigger chapters than others. The chapter two with these five questions, uh, we focused really on the YCJA, the Young Offenders Act that preceded it, and we did some cartoon analysis about uh, you know, to what extent is the YCJA and the Young Offenders Act, historically, to what extent did they, did they provide a deterrence? To what extent did they serve a function of bringing justice into society? And therefore, here you're gonna have to unpack a cartoon to find a perspective. We also looked at some numbers and charts and stuff like that to see the effectiveness of the YCGA, and you'll see that on number 12. Now the concept we looked at in chapter two was the idea that justice is blind. And number 13 is just asking, you know, why do we portray justice as being blind? Two final questions to round out chapter two include, what is the purpose of advocacy groups in Canada, straight out of the textbook? And what's the purpose of the young, the Youth Justice Committee? How is it like a circle, again? The language there, straight out of the textbook. So I would ask you to review the bolded terms and key points in the textbook as well. Our next major chapter, so one was a major chapter, two was a minor chapter, three is a major chapter again. We have 10 questions from chapter three. So what we have here is a chart that looks at some changes in Canada, including changes surrounding feminism and changes surrounding uh, you know, women's rights. And we want you to be able to look at this and make some kind of uh, conclusion as to what's being shown above. Another major focus of chapter three, you may recall we did a chapter three evaluation, the first half of it was all, can you match mobility rights and equality rights and fundamental rights with examples? So I want you to be able to look at those examples and figure out what type of right is being shown here. Keeping in mind, this is now gonna be a test next week, and this is the second time we've talked about it and seen it. You don't get to use your notes next week. It's not open notes, it's not open textbook. Um, this is it. So you do need to study. Questions 18 and 19 with regards to chapter three look at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So again, you'll be in your best interest to go back, study the difference between the types of rights within the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I'll give you scenarios like when in 2020, the, during the outbreak of COVID-19, the federal government closed our borders to travel. It reflected which aspect of the above passage. So I'm taking something that's very relevant to your life today, and I'm getting you to uh, read and apply something that's being shown to you. We also looked at the FLQ crisis. We looked at the Emergencies Act, the War Measures Act, the USA Patriot Act, Homeland Security, all of these pieces of legislation that are part of that, that struggle between freedom and control. And um, there's a quote there from NDP leader Tommy Douglas during the FLQ crisis showing his, his response as to to what extent the War Measures Act was needed. And I want you to be able to use that quote to apply some of the language and scenarios that we talked about in class. Then finally, there's some more match, fundamental equality, legal and democratic rights. So in a test out of 40, just knowing those four types of rights can get you somewhere around 20% of the exam. So that is matching. That, that, it can't get any easier. There's no way to make that easier. So section four is straight out of chapter four. And, and chapter four is our unit that we just finished yesterday. We finished up on collective rights. We had our evaluation yesterday. And I mentioned the last time that we went through this together that there was a about 400 page document about the IAA that I went through and I gleaned from it lots of important stuff. But among the important stuff that I gleaned from it were you know, the reasons behind the creation of the IAA and the reasons why the IAA was looking to get support from Albertans. And uh, so I have a chart there for you. And then from that chart, I think you should be able to apply it back and say, what kind of rights are we looking at? We also talked a lot about lobbying in chapter one and in chapter three and four. So I want you to look at these rights and say, which one of these has them lobbying? Which one has them putting pressure on the government and lobbying for change? 
And uh, in the textbook and in our online digital textbook, we talked about other indigenous groups, other Aboriginal groups, and we talked about the Métis National Council, the Assembly of First Nations, and the Native Women's Association. But there is no group called the Aboriginal Syndicate of, of Alberta. Uh, that's a, that's a, a red herring. That's, that's not the answer. So next up, we have um, also with regards to the chapter on collective rights, we talked about separatism and uh, how it comes from alienation and how that comes from marginalization. And we have that cartoon that we spent uh, at least 30 minutes unpacking. So I thought it would be purposeful to put that on there with the language that we talked about when we unpacked the cartoon. Those are those crises again that we've talked about, including the National Energy Program that we talked about as well when we looked at chapter four. And the online digital textbook and the textbook itself talks about some of the Western responses, including the creation of political parties like the Reform Party. In class, we looked at uh, our treaties and what the treaties, what the legacies of treaties are for Canadians. So things like healthcare and education, hunting and fishing rights coming from treaties like six, seven, and eight here in Wetaska. Spent some time unpacking this cartoon as well, looking at what is it saying about the Indian Act. So we're looking at the cartoon and looking at elements within it. Why is the Indian Act in this garbage can? Or what is that saying about the cartoons, the cartoonist perceived idea of what the government's up to? Williams social videos are a nice way to review as well. And in the Williams social video on chapter four, she talked about how our relationship between Europeans and Canada's Aboriginal peoples went from cooperation to competition to coercion. So this question is an example of a simple uh, recall question where it's testing whether or not you have been uh, you know, listening to those key big rocks shown to you in class. And then we have immigration, which we'll be looking at today and uh, Monday and Tuesday next week. And when we look at immigration, we're going to be looking at how it impacts Canada Anytime that you're looking at a, a numbers study like immigration, it's natural to have some questions that have numbers attached to it. We're going to have some, some graphs to unpack, and we're going to be asking you to apply some of the language that we'll be looking at here, like xenophobia and racism, and this policy of, of white Canada policy um, that many people have been critical of, and how it's different than, say, multiculturalism today. So that's the midterm. Having shown you the midterm, Having you being able to access the midterm on YouTube should be in a position to do well next week. We've had a evaluation on each of these chapters. We will have time to study chapter five, but it's a minor chapter before we get to the midterm. We're not bombarding you with exams. I'm not bombarding you with homework every night. But you should see the midterm as an opportunity now like many of you did yesterday, to show that you're, you're understanding the course. The number of people yesterday were 80, 90 and above. So we had amazing results yesterday. And I'm gonna guess we're gonna have amazing results on this unit test. So how do we get amazing results? The next step, obviously our next step is to go have our mask break. But you know, this weekend, I would suggest go into our digital textbook, go over the lessons again. Go over this lesson. Look at those questions that I just highlighted for you. See if you can break down the building blocks of them. See if you understand the language. If you have questions, ask them next week. On the test, I'm not answering the questions. A test is a test. It's a you, not an us. It's us now, but it's a you then. So if you're looking at this test and you have problems, you need to identify and ask questions before the actual exam. All right, so uh, we will get into chapter five more after the, our mass break, but let's take a mass break, go outside, and I'll see you later.